Hi, this is Walker Evans with the ColumbusUnderground.com podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by Peter John Ross, who normally goes by Ross. Is that correct? Uh, a local filmmaker. Welcome. Hello. Uh, we're sitting up here in your, your studio. Yep, um, production Partners Media. Cool. Um, yeah, so, so you... Um, well, let, let's talk a, a little bit about your background first. Um, may, maybe, you know, your, your educational background, how, how you kind of got started in filmmaking. Have you always been in Central Ohio? Uh, well, I was born in Reynoldsburg, but then when I was six months old, I moved to Cincinnati. Then later, a few years later, I moved to Cleveland type area. Mm-hmm. Then moved to El Paso, Texas for a few years. And then, uh, eventually <coughs> moved back to Columbus in the, in Pickerington, the suburbs for my last two years of high school. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've lived in different places. I, I, you know, I spent a little time in Egypt and Europe. But then I also lived in Santa Monica for a summer, but almost always, I, w- I never really felt like I didn't live in Columbus during those times. <laughs> right. Cool. What, where, where did you, uh, where did you go to, to school? Did, I mean, what, what, what I, I'd gone about? to Ohio State, uh, Newark, then to Ohio State, the main campus. Mm-hmm. And it's a wonderful school, but it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. And then I did some basic classes at Columbus State, but then I went to Bowling Green and I never finished, but I, I always think of it as if I were to say what university I went to, it would be Bowling Green State. Bowling Green. Do, do they, you studied film there? No. <laughs> oh, really? I was there to study music. Mm-hmm. And um, I stopped and I, I took some film like classes, but they weren't ever about production. Mm-hmm. They were like uh, film theory. Like a, it was like a, to get an easy English credit, they had a great class where you read a novel, see a movie based on it, and then you see a remake of that movie and you write a, a paper about the differences between the three. Mm-hmm. And I remember having knocked down, drag out fights over the one where it was reading uh, The Wizard of Oz, seeing the movie, and guess what the remake was? The Wiz? E.T. Really? E.T. is a point-by-point remake of The Wizard of Oz. Hmm. And I just remember, I was so blown away, I, I wanted to fight it and wanted to find it until at the beginning of the internet at that time, in the mid-90s, I, I read an interview where Spielberg basically said, I remade E.T., <laughs> Once I read that, I stopped arguing with a professor about it. Wow, wow. I, it's been a while since I watched ET, so I'm gonna have to go back and watch it with that with that in mind, and, yeah. and really think about it, huh? So, so what what kind of got you uh, moving in the direction of, of producing film and, and that well, that whole passion? I, I'd been a musician since I was five, mm-hmm. playing piano, guitar, saxophone, drums, keyboards, you name it. I try to play everything, and I always wanted to do music for movies. And in 1997, I got a chance to do music for a movie. And I did, and I was all excited until I got a copy of the movie. And it was bad. And it wasn't even like Mystery Science Theater 3000 bad. It was <laughs> like bad without being funny. And I really screwed up. And I'd had a, my friends had thrown me a party for the day I was getting the tape. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't watched it yet. And it was <laughs> one of the most embarrassing nights of my life. <laughs> But, and I I said something that everybody says this all the time. I said, I can do better than this. But my entire life changed that night Mm -hmm. when I said that, because it was more like, no, I will. And the truth is, it's not as easy as it looks. And there's this great parallel, which is, uh, you know, nobody goes into a guitar store, Mm -hmm. buys a Fender Strat, and walks out thinking, well, I've been listening to music my whole life. I can play like Hendrix. So why is it now today everybody with a <coughs> camcorder thinks they just by buying it and we go, well, I've been watching movies and TV my whole life. Obviously, I can make a really good movie. Right. And it isn't true. Uh, it, and so few people could ever do that. And right. it takes a lot of work. And that, you know, we're in this new era of kind of digital filmmaking with the desktop, just like desktop publishing. There's now desktop filmmaking mm-hmm. that... I mean, with Windows and with Mac, you get either iMovie or Windows Movie Maker for free. You can edit video of anything and add music, add edits, add cuts, add titles for free mm-hmm. with any computer today. Right. And it has completely changed everything. I mean, that, that technology being that readily available to anybody, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, it just started. Today, it's very commonplace. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think overall the changes are for the better or for the worse? I mean, obviously, it's, yes, it's, it's, it's flooding it's the both. market with a lot of material. Well, the thing about it is, it's like, at this point, what I always like to say is, anybody can make a movie, mm-hmm. but not everybody can make a good movie. Right, right. 
And it takes a lot of work and dedication and practice. At least for me, it takes a lot of work to try to make a good movie. And mm -hmm. you don't always succeed every time. Mm -hmm. I've made a lot of clunkers. <laughs> Um, you, you're involved with several local filmmaking groups, correct? Yes. Yeah. Can, can you talk about a little bit about those groups and what kind of role they play? Uh, there are basically two different filmmaking groups in Columbus today. Mm -hmm. There's Indie Club Columbus, which is the local chapter of a national group. And then there's MOFA, the Mid-Ohio Filmmakers Association. They really tried to go for MOFO, but nobody would <laughs> take it seriously. Uh, and basically, uh, Indie Club Columbus is once a month at the uh, Landmark Gateway. Mm -hmm. And both these groups are entirely free. And once a month at the Landmark Gateway, right now it's the third Monday of the month. Mm -hmm. And I think that might change, though. But mm -hmm. for now, it's still the third Monday of the month at the Landmark. <coughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a place to where you can – it's, it's kind of geared a little more towards educating more of the amateurs or what they call micro cinema, the people that are making movies with camcorders and learning. Mm -hmm. No matter what their age, I mean, you have guys in their 40s and 50s, along with kids that are 19 and 20, that are making movies with no money with their camcorders and editing them and putting them on YouTube. Uh, and this is a group for them to help kind of help educate and connect them to the more professional level. Because mm -hmm. it's a way to, it's a way to screen your movie and get feedback. Like if you have a short film, it's a way to screen it. If you have announcements, if you're looking for crew to volunteer for your product, this is a nice group for that. Whereas MOFA is, at this point, it's almost, <coughs> excuse me, entirely social. Mm -hmm. They meet currently, I mean, they're trying to find a more permanent home. Right now, they meet at Coaches on Bethel, uh, Coaches Bar and Grill. Mm -hmm. And really, what happens is when MOFA comes in, it kind of takes over the bar. They turn off all the the big video sc the screens of sports and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just a giant gathering of filmmakers, again, both amateur and professional. And it's a purely social event. Mm -hmm. It's just a big mixer where people come to... Introduce yourself, talk to people. You have a name tag and talk to people. You can meet actors, you can meet directors, producers, editors, you name it. And it's an entirely social mingling atmosphere. So, you know, the two different groups exist and serve kind of two different purposes. Mm -hmm. cool. But but they're, they're both, um, you know, well-supported well communities. Yeah, you know, both of them friendly. have... <coughs> both of them... <coughs> both of them have, a, a, you know, different levels of kind of... Every month you have either more or less people, but, you know, there's decent numbers at both. And, you know, there's some people that attend both groups religiously. And it's nice to see the community has options. Mm -hmm. There's more than one option. Cool. Um, as far as um, screening some of these films, and I know there's various events here and there. Um, what kind of um, audience participation are you seeing? I mean, is, is there sort of a, uh, a dedicated fan base for local films or, or do you get different crowds depending on what's showing? It's different crowds depending on what's showing and also more importantly, how much the filmmakers work to get the general audience mm -hmm. uh, by trying to get people to come. See, a lot of people don't understand when they hear the words movie business, that whole second word gets lost on them. Right, right. And there's the whole idea of you know, you have to let people know mm -hmm. your movie's screening. Mm -hmm. If they don't know, why would they show up at something they didn't know existed? And right. so... It's the same as if you have a band, you know, playing exactly. or you know, any other sort it's of It's no different. I mean, the parallels between the music scene and the film scene are very similar. Mm -hmm. And there's this new... It's kind of like filmmaking is like the new garage band. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in the 90s, I worked at Lang Music on the east side selling guitars and stuff, and... The parallels between, you know, the guitar store and all that stuff you do for home recording and the way bands, everybody was in a band, mm -hmm. no matter what their age. Like, if they were 40, they're like, well, I used to be in a band. I want to do it again now that I can get a $100 guitar from Korea. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the same thing now with, like, I can get a $400 camcorder and edit on my computer. Mm -hmm. And so there's this great parallel, the same type of thing. The industries are very similar. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, in terms of attendance... <coughs> Again, with those different groups and people interested in the arts, that's your fundamental crowd. Uh, Mad Lab has a fairly successful uh, film festival they do in the fall last year and this year. Mm -hmm. uh, last year's attendance was through the roof. This year, they added a second show, so people kind of split between the two. Mm -hmm. But it was still a pretty good attendance for both. Right. Um, that, that's um, any venue you can do now. It's to sit in a movie, th an actual movie theater and watch your movies play on a big screen, it's pretty rare. I mean, there's only so many screens. There's only so many people to see things that 
any chance to get your movie seen in a real theater is a big deal. Mm-hmm. So I, I try to, I've, I've been doing various types of film festivals. I used to do these things called drop your shorts film festivals, then look at my shorts film festivals. <laughs> and we had some great support from people in the dispatch, the alive and the other paper. Uh, Cause these were kind of like once a year type events without being adamantly scheduled. Right. But as the quality of films have improved, uh, especially just in the last 12 months alone, mm-hmm. the quality of the movies being made in Columbus, thanks to technology, thanks to kind of some influx of new blood of people from different cities moving to Columbus, mm-hmm. kind of the bar has been raised pretty high lately. And we're also with that seeing a great deal more legitimacy in the printed press. And that's been helping us a lot. The fact that, People like Melissa Starker dedicated a whole issue to local filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Granted, I I wasn't even listed in it in any way, shape, or form, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's like a huge coup to have a a whole issue dedicated to Columbus's filmmaking scene. And I I became aware of two filmmakers I'd never heard of before. And that's wonderful to see support where it was, I don't want to say lacking as much as I don't know if they were waiting for the film's qualities to get to where they are now before they would consider it legitimate or what's happened to suddenly make the film scene feel more legitimate today. But it, it's that it's that same pop culture beast of partially the media is responsible for making something popular, but they're also just reporting on what is popular. Right, right. And it's that cycle that if you can't kind of push the snowball down into an avalanche – you know, you're stuck in between, right, which is right. where Columbus filmmaking has been for years. And, and being thinking about it and looking at the quality of either my own works and even other people's works, maybe the stuff being done five years ago didn't warrant the press because it wasn't ready yet. Mm-hmm. But the stuff today really looks good. Technology is allowing that. There's these whole things to where you're getting 35 millimeter lens adapters on your camcorders. Mm-hmm. And you're creating that shallow depth of field that normally only a film camera could have. And it's in high definition. Yeah, well, it it sounds like, um, you know, maybe it just took kind of reaching that critical mass to kind of hit that tipping point to to really... And it it helps to have better films Mm -hmm. to help tip that scale. I mean, with with a group like MOFA, one of the big things I've seen that shifted was the high-end professionals that work in commercials and television. Mm Mm-hmm that normally never had anything to do with the film scene are now paying attention. They're renting gear to filmmakers at a lower rate because there's a difference between commercial work and art and they're viewing it as an artistic thing. So they'll lower their rates for that. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people that work on commercials are getting an interest in making films. Like one of the best things is something we're showing at Cowtown this year is a, a sci-fi web series called Aiden 5. Last year in 08, we had our first ever 48-hour film project in Columbus. Mm-hmm. That was an enormous hit. There were like 27, 28 teams of filmmakers. Mm-hmm. Teams of filmmakers. Right. And the quality movies, there was about four to six movies that were really good. Mm-hmm. But there was this one we called Aiden 5 that was by a large margin better than the rest. I mean, when I watched it, I said, that's the one that's going to win. And it did. And it went so far as to be the second runner up for the entire 48 film project worldwide. And it went to Cannes to play in the actual film festival. So it was a big deal. And they've now turned that into a web series. And some of the people that kind of were on other teams that same year are working on Aiden five, the web series now, because there's this, camaraderie not competition right right and it's a beautiful thing and they're everybody's raised their bar <coughs> and you know and the people that worked on aiden five are professionals they're professional directors formerly of pax and now work at mills james studio working on tv commercials and tv shows mm-hmm. so it's people like that are now making short films and you know they didn't even have to use the resources of mills james to do it mm-hmm. they had their own resources a lot of it is They've been sharpening those tools with commercials for so long. It's time to do something fun and creative. Mm. And then this year's 48, the 2009 48 hour film product, there were like nine or 10 movies that were of exceptional quality. Mm -hmm. So again, maybe it was that spirit of competition. Maybe it was just the availability of that gear, the just whatever it was, everybody started to really bring their A game. 
Nice. <clears throat> well, one of the things I've been hearing a lot about lately and talking to um, civic leaders and, and politicians and, and various um, um, entrepreneurial areas as well is, is kind of the talk about the emerging creative class and, and the creative economy. Um, it, it sounds like everyone um, is really placing a lot of value on on this kind of you know, resurgent economy. It's where a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs are coming out of, although it doesn't seem like anyone really has, has their head wrapped around, you know, how, how to boost those types of individuals and how to boost those people. A, a lot of people look specifically at, um, you know, um, performance art and visual artists, but, you know, I, I throw everything in there from, you know, graphic designers to, you know, film production studios to everything like that. How, how do you, how do you do you, do you have any opinions, I guess, on, on on how that can kind of bolster the entrepreneurial spirit of the city? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, I mean, companies are more than 50% of the companies are still behind the eight ball on technology and the power of the web. Mm -hmm. I mean, new, the way newspapers are failing in favor of the Internet, uh, it's going to be the same thing, or it already is. You're seeing it, and they're not reporting as much. The yellow pages, mm -hmm. the print yellow pages, are almost non-existent because everybody's going to Yahoo yellow pages mm -hmm. or Google, mm -hmm. and that internet presence, and soon within five to ten years, the necessity of multimedia, <coughs> that's going to really inspire the whole entrepreneurial spirit of these small boutique production companies of one to three people are going to be making a decent living mm -hmm. providing for all these clients because there's going to be so many of them. Those rates are all going to drop and you're going to have a form of art and commerce converging in that regard. And again, there are media classes in a lot of the high schools. Granted the rich white suburbs, not really the inner city schools, right? right. which is really depressing mm -hmm. in Columbus that the only thing they've got is Fort Hayes. Really? Mm -hmm. That's the only one that has really significant media classes. And that's a very specialized thing. Whereas Dublin, Gahanna, Pickerington, all of the, and all three Dublin high schools have extensive and wonderful multimedia classes. And, uh, and I, I'm a judge every year for the Dublin Seattle High School Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And it blows my mind the quality of work I'm seeing high school kids doing. And it's just an elective to them. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is what I do for a living. And even that first year, there was a girl who did stuff that I still can't do mm -hmm. with animation. Oh, so, so, so you think it would be uh, to the benefit of the entire city to to help support that early yeah. early education? Absolutely, education. It, it's it's to present alternatives mm -hmm. for everybody and that equality that we're supposed to be seeing. Right. And I would like to see more of that. I'd like to see media classes being made more available. I mean, part of an equalizer that we used to have was what we talked about before we were recording, which is public access mm -hmm. offered media training classes, and they were unbelievably cheap well that's been gone for now over seven years mm -hmm. and that's really depressing because there's no equalizer now for an inner city youth they don't have any way to learn this stuff as opposed to a rich kid in the suburbs they have all at their fingertips and they don't even have to care right hmm. uh, and it just it's, it's i get really depressed when i see that side-by-side -side comparison we'll have to figure out a good way to fix that. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. I mean, uh, what we really need is a really good attorney to tackle the city on bringing back public access, but the city council and the mayor are not really for it. Mm -hmm. And without any, no one's championing bringing it back. <coughs> well, shifting gears completely, I, I wanted to, to mention uh, you have the Countdown film series coming up mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks. Uh, yeah. Can you give us kind of an overview about what, what that is? Uh, on December 3rd, it's a Thursday at 7 p.m. We're going to be screening about two and a half hours of Columbus-made short films. Some of them will be as short as like one minute. Mm -hmm. Some of them are 27 minutes. It's going to be kind of a roller coaster ride. I mean, there's some drama. There's some sci-fi. There's comedies. There's documentary. Like there's a Holocaust documentary. Uh so and, and we're playing the same show again on Sunday, December sixth at three p.m. Mm -hmm. It's the same show twice, and we're doing it free this time. No, and this is at the Continent. It's right. at the Continent movie right. theater called The Screens at mm -hmm. sixty three sixty Bush Boulevard. Okay, in Col Northern Columbus, it's right off of seventy one. Uh, the theater is really nice. Um, it's it's currently like a dollar theater, and they like to open it up for things like they show Bollywood movies and mm -hmm. really different films that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Right, right. 
And uh, again, in this in this kind of landscape of the multiplex, it's it's a eight screen or nine screen theater, and they're giving us their biggest screen for this. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're renting a theater ourselves so that we don't have to charge admission because mm-hmm. a lot of these movies are going to be, it's their world premiere. Mm-hmm. They haven't shown at any festivals. They haven't been screened on TV in any form. Are they, and these are all locally made? All central Ohio based films. Cool. Uh, and again, the quality of what we've got this year versus even just one year ago, we did 10 weeks of feature films last year. Mm-hmm. This year, I just didn't have enough finished feature films to put on a show. So the theater owner asked me if I wanted to do another countdown, but we did have enough compilation of short films to put on these shows. So we're we're putting it on this year, and it's going to be a really good show. We're showing in high definition for the first time. Cool. We normally have shown kind of standard F blown up off either DVD or videotape. This time we're going to go high def nice. and really try to make this look as professional as we can. Cool. It sounds like a pretty good uh, way for anyone interested in, in local filmmaking to kind of go and, and get a, a wide variety of, of what's going on. Yeah. And free. No right. Less. Yeah. Can't beat that. You can't beat that. I mean, and, and the thing is, is every time we do a screening there at the continent, there's three or four bars within walking distance. So after the screening, we do an impromptu after party and oh, everybody cool. walks to one of the, the same bar and we all hang out and talk and people either ask, how did you do this? How do you do that? And, it's it's a great way you can meet some of the actors that were in the movies if you were like, that guy was really good. Right. Because, again, you always deal with this syndrome of, <clears throat> and again, it parallels to bands and everything. It's, you're only you're only good if you're from out of town. And a lot of people, are, you can't be good, you're my neighbor. Right. If you were good, you wouldn't be here. There's yeah. always that attitude we've been fighting for years. Mm-hmm. And I really feel like we have the material to combat that now. Like the movies, what they're about, how they're shot, how they're put together. The quality is getting so good. We could we make things that look like real movies at this point. Cool. Um, and and if anybody needs more information about that, what, what's the website? Cowtown.sunnyboo.com. And that's s o n n y b o o dot com. Okay. Cool. Well, th- thanks for sitting down. Uh, you know, I, I encourage everybody to go check this out uh, this weekend and uh, see what they think. Thanks so, a lot. Cool. Talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.